The program aims to support environmental and climate change statistics. And to explain that program, I have two distinguished guests with us today. Alessandra Alfieri, who is the Assistant Director in the IMF Statistics Department in charge of the Environmental and Climate Change Statistics Program. And we're very privileged to have Governor Talukter with us from the Central Bank of Bangladesh, who's going to outline some of the important policy and program work around climate they're doing in Bangladesh and how these statistics can support them in that work. But before we begin our discussion, I would like to acknowledge and thank the government of Switzerland, the key sponsor of this program. It is through the generous support of the State Secretariat, Swiss Secretariat for Economic Affairs, SECO, and I'll use that word from now on, <laughs> it's through their generous support that we were able to launch this program earlier this year. And we're very fortunate to have Dominic Favre with us. He's the Executive Director at the World Bank for Switzerland. And he's here representing SECO, and he's going to deliver some opening remarks and tell us why it's so critically important that countries have macro-relevant environmental and climate change statistics to support financial and macroeconomic policy. Dominic. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, Governor, it's an honor seeing you. I know that we have ties huh, with Switzerland. You worked a long time ago on a Swiss project and uh, I will tell back home that when you start working with a Swiss project you become a governor <laughs> and a minister in one of yeah. the most populated countries of the world. So I'm, it's an honor meeting you and Alessandra, I would like to thank you to congratulate you for the excellent work of your department. It, your department is one of four departments uh, SECO is working with to support uh, objectives to leverage the IMF account to enhance its climate portfolio. The sixth assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has again noted that human activities, principally through emissions of greenhouse gases, have unequivocally caused global warming. So there is no longer a question. Uh, climate change has far-reaching economic, social and financial implications, reduced water availability, lower agricultural production, damages to infrastructure, infectious disease malnutrition are just a few of the implications of climate change, all of which have significant implications for inclusive growth, financial markets and financial stability. The devastating wildfires in Canada and flooding in Libya that occurred over the last six months serve as sober reminder of what is at stake. As the IMF Managing Director noted at the 9th IMF Statistical Forum, governments need robust and comparable data to develop the right policy measures. This is why the Swiss government feels it is important to provide capacity development in this area. For this reason, we have, provided, we have been supporting natural capital accounting for almost 10 years and we are thrilled to now work with you to support the inclusion of such climate-related data into financial and macroeconomic policy. In our experience, it used to be challenging to get ministries of finance to rely on climate and environmental data. We expect the project to play an important role in providing that missing link. Thank you very much and I wish to all of you a very good uh, meeting. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic, for studying, setting the stage for our discussion and we'll turn it over to Alessandra who will outline the program and the type of data that we can uh, produce, that countries can produce uh, through this program. Alessandra? Uh, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Dominic, for the uh, intervention and for the kind support for the program. So when, uh, when government develop economic uh, or financial policy, they generally have a rich set of data that they can draw upon to guide their work. Unfortunately, this is not the case for environment and climate change statistics. There are large data gaps in environment and climate change statistics when compared to other types of statistics. As you can see from the graph, from the plot, um, 
Even the most advanced economies have not mainstreamed the collection and production of this data in their statistical systems. These data gaps were recently noted by the G20 at their meeting in November 2022 in Bali, Indonesia, where they launched a new G20 data gaps initiative aimed at addressing critical data gaps related to climate change. Vulnerable communities who have historically contributed the least to the current climate change are disproportionately affected. The least developed economies are shown as blue dots at the bottom right of the plot. These economies are emitting less than the developing and developed economies, yet they have the lowest capacity to cope with climate change. Unfortunately, these are also the economies where the data is most lacking. So to address this data gap, the Statistics Department of the IMF recently has launched a new Environment and Climate Change Statistics Capacity Development Program, which will provide IMF member countries with the tools, resources, and technical capacity to develop a range of macro-relevant environment and climate change statistics. As Jim noted earlier, the initial phase of the project is funded by the Swiss State Secretariat for Economic Affairs. The IMF is unique positioned to help member countries integrate environment and climate change data with macroeconomic statistics and support the use of this data in the development of macroeconomic and financial policy, building on our existing macroeconomic statistics capacity development program, which already supports a large number of countries. So the program has four main pillars. Sorry, I have four main pillars. Um, one, the program utilizes mature internationally adopted environmental economic accounting standards, such as the internationally endorsed system of environmental economic accounting. The two, the program leverages open geospatial data sets, such as those on the World Bank Climate Change Knowledge Portal, with over 60 terabytes of open obs Earth observation data, as well as other data sets. Three, the program encourages co-development and sharing of tools across countries by utilizing open software and knowledge sharing platform. Four, the program works in close coordination and collaboration with other international agencies, including the World Bank and the United Nations, leveraging their expertise on environment and climate change statistics, and integrates it with macroeconomic statistics. It is clear that to attain the Paris Agreement, <clears throat> we will need to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. One area for the, where the IMF is assisting countries is developing data to support macro-relevant mitigation policies. This include, for example, supporting the compilation of greenhouse gas emission accounts, carbon footprints, and environmental taxes and subsidies. This data will allow countries to better track the source of their emissions, understand how their production and consumption patterns impact greenhouse gases emissions, and whether or not their fiscal policies are having their desired impact. The chart on the screen shows global greenhouse gas emissions by industries for advanced economies. It shows that while electricity producers in advanced countries have, have been able to reduce their share of emissions, this has been offset by increased emission in mining, transportation, and storage, and other service industries. So the IMF is also working with countries to develop data that support macro-relevant climate adaptation policies. Government, businesses, and individuals need to adapt buildings and infrastructures to be more resilient to increasingly frequent and severe climate hazards, such as drought, floods, and wildfires. The adaptation will require significant investment across all sectors of the economy. The chart on the screen shows some early work related to government expenditure on environmental protection. As you can see, the data is sparse and not granular enough for policy work on climate change. The IMF will work with countries to fill these data gaps and help them understand and track climate adaptation investment and expenditures along with the sources of funds used to finance these investments. 
The program also supports countries with the development of indicators that quantify future physical risk. A physical risk indicator combines information on hazards, exposure, and vulnerability to help policymakers understand the risk climate hazards pose to population, the economy, and the financial markets. For example, certain homes and businesses may no longer be insurable due to flood risk. This places individual businesses and financial institutions that finance these properties at risk. Although these indicators are macro-critical, not many countries have national data to compile these indicators. Fortunately, we can leverage open geospatial data sets and climate models, which combined with national data can support the development of these indicators. So the IMF is working on developing a tool in cooperation with the European Space Agency that allow countries to visualize and estimate physical risks for various hazards based on publicly available data. We have used the World Bank Climate Change Knowledge Portal in this case, as well as other data sets presented on a natural grid. So, The video presented on the screen shows how policymakers and researchers will be able to assess physical risks at granular level geographically. Using Bangladesh as an example, first a base layer is selected. Next, an exposure layer is added. In this case, is graded GDP and is shown in increments of blue. Then we can add the heat index for an emission intermediate pathway shown in red. Combining the exposure data with the hazard data allows policymakers to point, pinpoint those areas that are at the highest risks. This data can further be overlaid with specific vulnerabilities to support the designing or appropriate adaptation policy and allocating investment in resilient infrastructure where needed. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. <laughs> now over to you, Governor, to talk about some of the work that you're doing in uh, Bangladesh and how these types of data might support you in that work. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Jim, uh, for inviting me at this uh, program. So first of all, uh, you have seen the map of Bangladesh. You know, it looks like a very big country. Actually, not really. It's a very small island, small land. If you com compare with the state of uh, Wisconsin of USA, the land is, a, is almost same, similar size. It's one of the smallest state in US. But the population is half of the USA. So you can imagine how densely the country is. And in the map, you have also seen that two mighty rivers, one is coming all the way from Himalayas, passing through India, and the other one is coming from China and also passing through India. And both the rivers actually cross Bangladesh and, 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 and ends in the Bay of Bengal. So these two rivers, you know, uh, during the uh, dry season, we don't get much water. So we are having desertation in some of the uh, area in Bangladesh, especially the northern area. But during the rainy season, we have abundance of water, you know. So we are having flood, also sometimes flood, flood, and, and in some cases what happens, the country, half of the country goes underwater by these two rivers. So you can imagine how much effect uh, uh, we are having. Bangladesh is one of the lowest carbon emitter, but we are the worst sufferer uh, because uh, there are large industrialist country beside us, and we are a naive victim of the uh, carbon emissions. Um, so to cope with uh, the climate change uh, uh, effect, uh, our government in back in 29 has adopted Bangladesh Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan. So in that plan, there was 44 programs to be taken in short, medium, and uh, long range, and uh, uh, including the 
uh, food security, social protection, and comprehensive disaster management, management etc. So Bangladesh uh, uh, formed two funds. One is Bangladesh uh, Climate Change Trust Fund. The other one is Bangladesh Climate Change Resilience Fund with our own money. And we started work since 2010. In last 10 years, we spent almost $10 billion from our own resources to, to uh, uh, having program with uh, adaptation and, and mitigation. One of the uh, important development is uh, in 2018, Bangladesh has uh, adopted a new Delta plan. It's called uh, Bangladesh Delta Plan 2100. So I don't know any other country has developed this kind of plan or not, but we had to because we are in a Delta and we have to live there with this uh, big uh, population. So the vision of this program is to achieve safe, climate resilient and prosperous Delta. So we have uh, five major goals in the uh, Delta Plan uh, uh, 2100. The first one is ensure uh, safety from floods and climate change related uh, disasters. The second one is ensure water security and efficiency of water uses. Third one is ensure uh, sustainable and integrated river systems and estuary management. Fourth is conserve and uh, preserve wetlands and ecosystems that promote their and promote their wise use. The final one, develop uh, effective institutions and equitable governance for in-country and transboundary water resource management. So as I started with that, uh, two big rivers actually created this delta, and we have to leave, we have to protect uh, our delta. Uh, as, a, as a governor of the central bank, uh, um, uh, my main responsibility, of course, with the price stability and the financial stability. But in, it, in addition to that, uh, we cannot ignore uh, the uh, climate change activities and climate change effects, especially in Bangladesh. So the central bank uh, in Bangladesh, we have initiated the green banking policy guidelines for financial institutions in 2011. We have also have another policy for sustainable finance with a sustainability rating for financial institutions. So we publish the rating to make a competition that the financial institutions can lend more on green projects. Uh, we have uh, uh, finalized uh, policy in 2022 for issuing the green bond by the financial institutions. We have also made it mandatory for a climate risk fund with each of the financial institutions so that they can uh, mitigate uh, some of their risk, risks. Um, as I mentioned, the main responsibility of the central bank uh, that uh, is not directly with the uh, uh, implementing the program, but the climate-related activities we divided into two. One is uh, adaptation, that is basically public good in nature, and the other one is mitigation, that is mostly private sector driven and also PPP uh, programs. So basically from the central bank, we try to uh, you know, encourage and finance uh, the private sector programs and, and, and projects. So why the statistics is, is very essential for us. You know, as I mentioned, some of the goals and the, and the programs, uh, which is uh, very essential, uh, you know, for setting baselines. Uh, we need uh, the data in a uh, regular frequency, maybe uh, weekly, daily, or of course monthly, because high frequency data is very essential, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, coping with this uh, flood and drought and other salinity uh, program. Also, the consistency of data is very important. You know, uh, without that, we cannot uh, take appropriate policy measures. And uh, synchronization of data set is another area. So I hope uh, from this IMF support, uh, this will be a big help for us because Bangladesh is the first country in Asia and Pacific to obtain the RSF facility from the IMF. I think this will uh, coincide with each other and hope uh, we'll be benefited most of it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, thank you, Governor, and uh, uh, congratulations on the, the wonderful work that you're doing in Bangladesh. Uh, we now have an opportunity for questions, so um, if you have a question of Alessandra, the Governor, myself, we're happy to take those at this time. Uh, I think just raise your hand and somebody will bring you a microphone and uh, we can ask your question. Any questions? We have a question in the back, yeah, so if uh, we can get a microphone. Great, and if you could stand up and introduce yourself, that would be great, and uh, yeah, ask your question. Do you hear me? Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Nuha Youssef. I'm a journalist from Morocco, and uh, thank you very much for uh, your presentations. Um, Many of you uh, maybe would not know that uh, we, are, we are suffering from climate change in Morocco. Uh, several years ago, you wouldn't find this uh, weather this time of the year in Morocco, so it's so hot. Uh, five years of drought and counting. How could the IMF help Moroccan government to improve uh, gathering data and uh, implementing these programs to predict, uh, like you said, uh, natural hazards like drought or floods uh, and so. Thank you very much. Thank you. You want, you want me to take it or? Maybe I, I can start and, um, and then ask Alessandra to, to jump in. I, I think one of the, the uh, parts of Alessandra's presentation about physical risk indicators is a, a key area where we're looking to support countries in understanding the risk uh, that uh, I, I think not just Morocco but many countries are facing due to things like heat stress and being able to at a very granular level identify you know, who's most vulnerable to that heat stress within a country and uh, help policymakers target policies to address those issues. Now the, uh, the, the good thing about these types of indicators is that they can be developed using open data, using uh, climate models that are generally accepted worldwide. So countries don't have to stand up new surveys which are often expensive and take a lot of time. We can utilize data from the World Bank uh, knowledge platform where they have open observation data. We can you utilize uh, climate models, we can bring that together, and then also leverage country data to add uh, indicators of vulnerability on, uh, on top of that map, if you would, and, and support policymakers and really understanding where policy can be most effective geographically within a country. I don't know, Alessandra, if you want to. Yeah, no, maybe just to add, I mean, the way we are working with countries is uh, uh, doing some kind of an assessment first to, to understand what the policy priorities uh, are, uh, understand the data which is available and the data needs that maybe need to be developed. And when there are data gaps, there are, uh, we can use the Earth observation data, as, uh, as Jim mentioned, and um, we can also uh, use some modeling overlaying the climate models with the, um, with the Earth observation data to basically understand what would be the path that will happen and where actually the, the problem will occur so that then countries can actually develop policies to try to address this issue. I mean, the issue of heat is an issue, I think, in a lot of countries. So the question is, where will be the, the, the highest affected areas? What would be the impact on population? And what would be the impact on the projected GDP? And what actually can be done? And then we can start thinking of what can actually can be done to mitigate these risks. So that's a, a little bit the idea, is trying to, to kind of tailor these programs to the uh, country's needs. Yep, a question in the back, if we, uh, a question in the back and a question in the front, uh, yeah. Thank you, my name is Farid, I'm advisor to one of the executive directors at the World Bank. First, let me thank Dominique. Uh, Switzerland has always been generous in supporting very meaningful projects. Uh, my question is, like, uh, what is the competitive advantage of IMF for such projects? Like, we see uh, UN is, like, have several departments that they work on climate change, and then the World Bank and many other organizations. And we know that resources are limited, and IMF knows this much better than any other. So 
why we duplicate, or is there any other, other, was there any other department in UN that they could do it, or they could leverage the current resources that they're using? Thank you. Right. I, that's, a, that's a very good question, and it's actually a question that we've asked ourselves as well, is you know, what, what is our role in this specific area? And I, I, would, I would put the emphasis on the, the word macro relevant environmental and climate change statistics. It's really, uh, this program is taking environmental and climate change statistics and drawing a direct link to the economic data that uh, we often use in policy at the IMF and elsewhere. And just to give you a couple examples, something like climate finance. You know, we're, we're very um, used to uh, developing estimates of bond issuances, uh, holdings, who's holding what specific bond issuance. Now we're able to dig into that and uh, uh, decompose it to identify climate finance and the different types of climate finance, whether it's uh, bond finance or debt security financing, whether it's equity financing, and also put a little bit of an indicator of the quality of that type of financing. One other example is uh, we have emissions data and you have traditional national accounts data. What we do in the context of this program is put that emissions data on the same uh, classification as our economic data so that you can readily calculate things like emissions intensities for given industries in a given country and look at that over a long time period. So I think the contribution that we make to this program is really tying together that economic data and that environmental and climate data to support financial and macroeconomic policy. Yeah, and, and maybe just to reassure you, we are working very closely with the World Bank. So the, the actually the data that was used as part of this exercise come from the climate change knowledge platform, and they have worked very, very closely with us. Where we have actually, I mean, now what we have done is overlaying it with macroeconomic statistics, and we plan also to increase this cooperation with the World Bank, where we actually uh, basically uh, play on our um, respective strengths. So, so it's uh, not at all being competitive or using uh, the World Bank resources and then we du duplicate the work, but it's really working together towards helping the countries moving forward. Uh, can I add one yeah, point? Yeah, please. I just want to add one point. You see, in Bangladesh, we have initiated the climate fiscal framework. Uh, in that, actually, every item of expenditure has been tagged, you know, whether how much it has impact on climate-related uh, spending or not. So we prepare our budget from the medium-term perspective, and we have a medium-term macroeconomic framework. So, so we are, uh, for long, we are trying to develop a climate-related indicators in the medium-term macroeconomic framework. But as I mentioned that uh, the frequency of the, the lack of uh, data especially the frequency, because we need the uh, data pretty you know, recently so that we can put into our medium to macroeconomic framework. I think uh, uh, this program will help us uh, in a bigger way to have a uh, climate-related indicator in the medium to macroeconomic framework. Thank you. Thank you. We, yeah, we have a question in the front here. Um, good afternoon. Uh, this is Elias Mzinda from Zimbabwe. Um, so following up on the governor's um, uh, as remarks, um, issues of data, um, from your viewpoint, what is it that African governments can do to ensure that we try, they try and build capacity to ensure that there is, um, the data is available and it's quality data that is usable? And also, what programs does IMF have that can actually also augment the process so that it is quicker? I think like you pointed out, climate change is real and it's happening very, very fast. So what is it that we can do to um, ensure that the process is quick and uh, there is sufficient uh, information? Yeah. I don't know, Alessandra, maybe you want to talk a little bit about how we roll out this program? Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a, it's a very good question. How do you actually start a program if you don't, uh, um, if you haven't started this work at all? So that's what I was mentioning before, that um, the, the assessment mission is very important in identifying what the priorities are. And then, of course, there is a, a, a quite extensive training program that we, uh, are, we have started some training already, but we plan to roll out uh, a, a increase 
increasingly this training program on climate change, which will first start, let's say, with a broad overview of what the issues are and the possible indicators, and then will actually zero in depending on countries' priorities on specific topics and work together with the countries in developing the data. What we are also trying to do is trying to leverage existing global data sets as an initial step for countries so they have already some kind of an initial uh, estimates of data that then can be used to bring different stakeholders on the table and start discussing of what additional data is needed, how to develop, and so on. But basically, rather than starting from a, a blank slate, using global data sets as an initial estimates. But of course, these global data sets will need to be adopted at the country level, will need to be validated. So so there is uh, all these discussions that need to happen at the country level um, as well. Maybe just to add one additional point is that um, it's, it's very important that this is a whole of government approach. This is not something you just assign yeah. to the statistics uh, agency and say, okay, this is your, you know, your job, go and do it. I think yeah. all uh, aspects of government, whether it's environmental, agricultural industries, the statistical office, certainly the central bank, the Ministry of Finance, all need to work together to stand up a program like this. And so cooperation is really key for success. Any other questions? I think I'm getting the uh, hook. So uh, uh, do we have time for one more last question? Or so it needs to be a very quick question. Yeah. And quick answer. Hello. OK, so my question is for Alessandra, because she mentioned um, uh, partnerships as one of the pillars of the program. Uh, I'm just curious if the partnerships are more geared towards uh, governments exclusively, or does it in include or involve some level of private sector uh, NGOs? Because I've seen, from my uh, experience, a lot of work being done grassroots level by private companies trying to work on this aspect of combining global open GIS data with the granular level data from, uh, from their practice. And that's, I think it's a really good resource to be tapped on. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a fundamental resource to look at. No, absolutely. I mean, this is a very good point. I mean, at the global level, we do work quite closely also with uh, the NGOs uh, and with uh, um, whoever actually develops data that is related to, the, to develop these global data sets. At the country level, this will be even more important to get uh, both the science side, the economic side, and the, uh, the statistical side sitting together as part of this cooperation that Jim was talking about. And the, and the business sector side as well, sitting together to uh, develop the program and to basically support the, the, the development of the statistical system, which actually cover the whole aspects, not only of government, but also private sector, as you clearly indicated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Governor, for being with us today. Thank you.